If you are a pilot, regardless of how many flights you have, what equipment you fly, who you were trained by, or how advanced your aerobatic skills are, flying is dangerous and complacency in any part of aviation can kill you. In my mind, the goal of every aviator should be to maximize their chances of surviving a visit to the sky. And this video right here aims to identify the mental as well as the physical shortcomings that may decrease these chances. For those that are new to this channel, I'm a paramotor pilot as well as a US PPA rated instructor in the sport. We operate under FAR part 103 in the FAR aims, which is a very short list of rules fitting on a single page in the book that basically says what we cannot do with our butt fans. Anybody and their grandma can go out and attempt to fly one of these things, but this does not change the fact that when you're in the sky, there is a certain level of knowledge and skill required to be safe. And my goal with this channel is to lift the sport up as a whole with its standard of pilot knowledge, skill, and safety. If you would, do me a huge favor, show some enthusiasm and support by hitting that like button down below, and then let's get after it. So kicking it off with our first quote, here, no matter what happens, fly the airplane. So while this may sound like common sense to anybody, there are so many examples of poor task prioritization in the cockpit. One famous example is an incident that took place in 1972 where a Lockheed TriStar was heading from New York to Miami. The flight crew of this flight were faced with a burnt out landing gear indicator light. It's a little light bulb that tells you when your landing gear is down and secure. All four members of the flight crew tunnel visioned on fixing this light bulb failed to notice that the autopilot was not activated and that they were gradually descending over the Everglades. And this single faulty 12 cent light bulb resulted in a perfectly flying aircraft with 177 passengers on board crashing into the Everglades, killing 101. I recently had the awesome experience of flying in my buddy's Bonanza and he showed me how to close the door properly so that we wouldn't get door pop. He said that while the door popping open is not the problem at all, the airplane flies perfectly fine, it's the pilot's reaction to it and forgetting his number one job that is the real problem. As I take these lessons to relate to paramotor, do not get tunnel visioned or stunned by a frivolity like operating a camera or your phone, or potentially the more serious stuff like a wing collapse or an engine out. There's a technique developed by an Air Force colonel named John Boyd to help a pilot prioritize and continue flying the aircraft regardless of the situation. John coined this the OODA loop, which stands for observe, orient, decide, and then act. And these four steps are in a continuous cyclical motion where we're always focused on the number one priority of flying the aircraft while also taking in new information and adjusting our orientation so that we are better set up for success in whatever situation we're faced with. As an example, say your engine quits mid-flight. How long is it gonna take you to observe the situation orient yourself to a landing position, decide on all the different options that you have, and then finally act on the one that you decide is best. The whole goal with the OODA loop is to constantly be doing it and thinking ahead of where you are presently. Number two on my list is aviate, navigate, and then communicate. And this is the order of operations that we want to follow whenever we're in the sky. We never want to get sidetracked from flying the airplane, but our next priority is navigating. It's keeping our head on a swivel. Where are we in relation to other pilots? Where are we in relation to the ground? We obviously don't want to get lost, and it's pretty hard to do on a paramotor that goes 25 miles per hour. But we always want to assume that something is flying at us. I'm going to keep my head on a swivel, and I'm way more likely to find the the other objects in the air with this mindset adopted. And then communicate. For a paramotor pilot, I think this more relates to the idea of not getting too sucked into talking with your Bluetooth buddies or making sure that your video looks great for the gram. Number three, when in doubt, hold your altitude. Nobody ever collided with the sky. It seems like all too often in the sport, people try to solve issues that they're having way too low to the ground. Not only does this dramatically increase your risk, it also increases your stress levels and your task saturation. If you're trying to sort out your stuck toggle while maintaining your altitude 50 feet off the ground, it's just giving your brain so much to cope with and try to work through. If the situation is flyable, just bring in that power and climb. Altitude is always your friend when sorting out issues like this in the sky. Cruising along to number four here, truly superior pilots are those who use their superior judgment to avoid those situations where they might have to use their superior skills. Regardless of how skillful you are as a pilot, you wanna avoid using 
100% of that skill in order to get you out of a situation. Because this means that you're not reducing the risks where you can, and now you found yourself in a bad situation. Aerobatics below reserve deployment, flying in an area with no obvious outs, flying in unstable conditions or conditions that you're unsure about. These are all examples of putting you in a situation where the odds are not stacked in your favor and where better judgment prior to these situations prevents catastrophe. Moving on to number five, fuel is liquid altitude. The only time you have too much is when you're on fire. As I mentioned before, altitude equals time and therefore fuel equals time. In any form of aviation, time is always a good thing. The slower you are forced to observe, orient, decide, and act, the better the outcome will be. So put more fuel in your tank so that you can have this time to deal with any sort of situation that you may face. Thankfully, the likelihood of you catching fire on a paramotor is pretty much zero. Unfortunately, I have to say pretty much because of this guy. Don't modify your paramotors, guys. One of my favorites here, number six, it's better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you were on the ground. Mother Nature is ruthless. She doesn't care how expensive your flying machine is. She doesn't care how long you've been flying or how many hours. The bottom line is she laughs at us and she has brought down the biggest of birds. All this to say we should only interact with her when she's having a good day. And if you don't know, don't test her. No matter how badly you may want to, regardless of how far you've driven to your LZ, how long it's been since your last flight, how many beautiful women are watching you, or handsome lads for my female audience or whatever way you swing. Do not test mother nature. I'm sure many of us have had this retrospective reflection on wishing that we were on the ground. So I'd love to hear your experience down below in the comment section and how this has changed your flying decision making. Okay, on to number seven here. It says, never let an airplane take you somewhere your mind didn't get to five minutes earlier. I haven't heard this one before, but I absolutely love it. I always say that accidents typically happen when you are out of presence. Meaning that as an example, you've taken off and you're in the air mentally before you actually are physically. This incongruence allows your physical state to fall behind, become uncoordinated, and then fail. But while presence is of course vital, I take this quote to encourage an analysis of a decision before it's actually made. And if you can't analyze the situation, then you shouldn't be finding yourself in it. As an example, say that we're flying down a canyon, Star Wars trench run style, and we do not know what is around the corner. If we don't, we should be climbing up to get that perspective before continuing to fly through the canyon. Because what is around Around that corner. It could be wires, it could be a bridge. It's a trap! How are you setting yourself up for success if you're just hoping that things work out? Almost there guys. Number eight, emergency landings are done to save lives, not airplanes. I think this quote originated from pilots acting on an emergency landing zone out of reach but that could potentially save the aircraft and they suffered a deadly crash because they were trying to make the landing zone that could save the airplane. As ultralight pilots, we enjoy a plethora of safe landing zones. A very relatable situation is where we are throwing that reserve and we're trying to stand up the landing to save the gear on our back. At the end of the day, your gear can always be replaced, but you cannot. So land on your cage, let it take the brunt of the impact. Crumple that zone. Okay, on to number nine. The three most useless things in aviation are runway behind you, altitude above you, and the empty space in your fuel tanks. To me, this one is all about margins and maximizing the margins that you control. Too often it feels like pilots, including myself, neglect expanding these margins out of laziness and convenience. Laying out in an area that provides minimal time or room for error to get in the air safely. Flying paramotors is not convenient. While it is portable and we enjoy a lot of freedoms, we need to do our due diligence to make sure that we are earning this privilege. So put that extra liter in the tank, back up 50 more feet before you launch, and fly an extra 100 feet over those trees so that you have that room for error. The more we can maximize our physical margins, the more we maximize our less objective, more subjective mental margins. And these mental margins are harder to identify, but just as important as physical. Having this room for error mentally is so underrated, as it is vital to making really good sound decisions in the air. Also, understand that these safety factors compound into an accident. What I mean by this is let's say that you forgot to pre-flight your reserve and you didn't check the radar app and now you're flying into a gust front and your reserve is deployed. Now you're in a world of hurt and it could have been avoided. Number 10, it's a classic. 
There are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but no old bold pilots. So let's say that you're flying along at the beach. There's a bunch of people down there and all of a sudden out of nowhere, this internal voice goes, watch this. It is time to seriously consider whether or not the decision that you're about to make is wise. The best life-saving advice I have ever received in the sport was that flying is already a miracle and people are already impressed that you're able to fly with a lawnmower, a bed sheet, and some string in between. So why do you feel the need to wingtip drag right in front of them? While I am all for safely pushing your skills to the next level, doing so with any sort of social pressure can very easily get you out of your comfort and skill level. Let me know which quote is your favorite down below as well as your general thoughts on aviation safety. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you want to help support me spread this message of safer flying to the community at large, please consider supporting me on Patreon, just like these wonderful people. And if Mother Nature scares you as much as me, you might find this video on weather to be helpful for your when to fly decision making. This is Lifted PPG. My name is Micah Stevens. Don't forget to take that deep breath and we'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time!